So in case you didn't notice, I'm black. Just thought I'd establish that baseline. What's less apparent is that I'm African American. What's even less apparent is that I am a husband, I'm a father, I'm a son, I'm a brother, I'm a friend, I'm an introvert, I am someone that you can have a conversation with for a couple of hours and I've never really disclosed anything about myself. That's me. And that's not unlike many of you as well. When we deal with the multiplicity of our identities. But what I didn't understand, and I had to learn it the tough way, was that oftentimes all of those pressures of trying to balance those different identities, if you're not careful, can be too much to bear. So about a year ago, I had my introduction, if you will, to mental health when I was awakened. I was sitting in my office in my nice, cushy corporate job, paying good money. And I was on a conference call, if you can imagine, a video conference call, because nothing's just audio anymore, right? So I was talking and I was engaging, and then all of a sudden, I got a lump in my throat. I physically could not swallow. My mind started to get really hazy. I couldn't have a, a one train of thought. So I excused myself from the call. I asked him to postpone it. Wasn't sure what was going on. So I said, let me go get a drink of water. So as I'm on my way to the kitchen area, I'm passing by folks and they're talking to me and I'm in a haze. I have really no idea what they're saying. So I knew something was wrong at that point. So I went to the admin who sat nearby just so she could know something's going on. And while I was talking to her, my teeth started to chatter. My legs started to tremor. And at this point, I didn't know, am I having a stroke? Is something going on? Is my family going to be OK, my children? So she said, listen, we're going to the emergency room. So she drove me to the emergency room. I'm texting my wife saying, hey, I don't know what's going on. She's freaking out. So I get to the emergency room, and they have me hooked up to the most expensive of devices, cardio machines, EKGs. So I'm there for a few hours. The doctor comes in and says, Mr. Fletcher, we don't really see anything physically wrong outside of some of your vitals are elevated, but we just think that's because of what's going on. They sent me home. Two days later, it happened again. Worse this time. I'm in the emergency room again, running through a battery of tests, not really knowing what's happening. And then after all of the specialists left, unsure what was going on physically, one doctor came in and said, Mr. Fletcher, Sean, how are things at home? How's your job? How is your stress and anxiety levels? Because nothing is wrong with you physically, even though it feels that way. These are symptoms of anxiety. And he also told me, he said, you know what? There's a good chance that your body gave you warning signs many years ago that you ignored. And he said, this was your second warning. He said, I suggest that you do something about it before you get the third warning. So I went on this quest of trying to understand. Once I knew I wasn't dying, I went on this quest to try to understand because it became a regular occurrence. It was something that once it was turned on, I just couldn't turn it off for some reason. So then I started to try to understand, and there was one symptom, one symptom that served as the catalyst that sent me on this journey to try and understand it, and it was a simple rash. Now, it's not what you think. Well, actually, it is. It's pro it probably is what you're thinking. It's a regular rash. But the interesting part about it is that once I got the courage once I, I put aside some of the shame and the stigma that goes with 
I was in the hospital for something mental health related. What's wrong with me? I mustered up the courage to talk to my brother. So I called him. I said, man, you wouldn't understand. This happened to me. I was in the emergency room. I didn't know what was happening to me. I didn't know if this was it. And I said, you know what, man? One thing that I had that I remember that kept popping up over the years was a rash. It would pop up on the back of my neck. Same spot. Not an inch to the right, not an inch to the left. Same spot. And he said, you know what, man? I used to get the same thing. And I went and saw a professional. I went to the Cleveland Clinic just to talk some things through. I said, huh, I didn't know that. I stored that conversation in the back of my mind. So then I, I talked to my father. And one thing you have to understand, my father struggled to understand why I would want to leave a job that was so high paying, provided for my family, a status symbol. You see, you have to understand, and one thing that I understood was that my father comes from a generation of prideful African-American men to where you don't just leave a job. Because what he knew and what I learned is that still, unfortunately, people of color still end up doing jobs and the performance that we do in that job oftentimes plays a significant factor and if other people of color coming behind us will have those same opportunities. That's why when you hear us say we do it for the culture, that's the emotion behind it. So he says, son, I don't get it. And I explained it to him. And I said, the job is great, but it's killing me. And he started to understand after a while. And he started to get it. And he said, you know what? When I was raising the five of you, I also got a rash. And he said, I never saw anybody. But I also had what I learned later on in life that were symptoms of mental health. And I didn't know what to do. So it continued me on this journey after having these encounters with my family to try and understand why was there this silence? Because I know we were young, I understand from my father's standpoint. But at some point, having the conversations, we talked about everything. We talked about life. We talked about sports. We talked about politics. My upbringing was respectable, respectable. From the standpoint of knowledge imparted upon us, nothing was left out. However, when it came to these conversations, never happened. So I wanted to understand it was my siblings, my friends. I had a friend that was one of my best friends I grew up with. Had chronic diagnosis of depression and anxiety. I never knew until recent years. How much more could we have helped one another? How much more could we have been that support system to one another had we had the, the muscles and the strengths of discourse so I wanted to know more, not just for my journey, but also within the African-American community at large. So the academic in me went to the research. I wanted to understand more about it. So a few things that I learned is that African-Americans are 20% more likely, according to uh, the Office of Health and Human Services, 20% more likely to experience serious mental health problems than the general population. And those include major depression. They include attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or ADHD, post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD, and unfortunately, as we're seeing more and more in our society, suicide. So with that, I also learned going through the research, 
from the National Alliance to End Homelessness. I also saw that there were two more risk factors that enhanced or increased the risk of being subjected to a mental health condition or illness. One was homelessness and the other was exposure to violence. And while African Americans only comprise 13% of the US population, we comprise 40% of the homelessness population. And we are more likely than any other racial group to be exposed to violence. And an, an additional unfortunate detail, very sad detail, is that our children are also more likely than their peers to be subjected to violence, thus increasing the likelihood of mental health conditions. So I also searched through the way that I grew up and also many overlaps that I saw from reading and from talking with those within the African American community. There were many overlaps within the experience. So I wanted to understand more of the potential barriers because I am not a mental health expert. My expertise is in human behavior and communication. So I wanted to go to discourse. Why aren't we having these conversations? And this doesn't necessarily apply to everyone, but I experienced it in my life. I grew up in a very faith-based, strong community to where we prayed about things. If there was a problem, there was no prayer that could not solve it. And then we moved forward. Whether we moved forward happy and whole, that was another issue, but we moved forward. And we also had a heavy reliance upon community. So we would get together and support one another may not have been a professional in the group qualified to deal with your particular issue or my particular issue, but we had the support of community and we moved on, whether whole or not. So I struggled with trying to understand where does my faith and spirituality end and how do I, and when do I just pick up and go to a professional that can help me? And also a misunderstanding of the mental health area. You're not crazy. It's not to be shunned. I was fortunate enough to do some work down in Central Florida when I was in grad school a long time ago. And we went around to different health uh, clinics and facilities in the Panhandle area that has a heavy African American population. They supported and served many underserved, marginalized, disenfranchised communities. And we talked, we had the fortunate opportunity to talk to many African Americans. And many of them flat out said, I have a mistrust of the healthcare community to where I won't even be able to learn about mental health or get myself checked out. Health maintenance in general. Many of them even went so, so far back as to cite the Tuskegee syphilis experiment to where many men of color, African Americans in particular, acted as guinea pigs to test the impacts of the syphilis strain that still had an impact many generations later as a reason why they didn't want to even immerse themselves in the healthcare system. And lastly, a perceived inadequacy of communication skills. We've all been there to where we knew something was going on with a friend or a loved one. We knew she had something going on. We knew things weren't just quite right with him. But we didn't know what to say. How do I approach it? I want to be delicate. What if nothing's wrong? I don't want to fracture the relationship. So that perceived inadequacy of communication skills oftentimes stopped us from even taking a first step. So in spite of all of that, in spite of uh, many of the different challenges and barriers within the African American experience related to discourse around mental health, I still 
wanted to understand what's possible because I never leave it at a problem. You move to solutions. So out of all of the data that tended to be very dense, some somewhat impractical that I saw within my research around mental health discourse, one thing stood out, the power of human connection, as simple as that sounds. And within the research, one thing that was so fascinating to me was that when we have a, a powerful, meaningful, positive, engaging opportunity with someone else, another human being, it actually releases a hormone called oxytocin to the brain, which then activates the prefrontal cortex, thus enhancing our ability to trust, to want to communicate and to collaborate just from a positive exchange with another human being. It doesn't get more simple. It doesn't get more simple than that. So I also study some of the other benefits just of normal human interaction. Strengthens our immune system, lowers our rates of anxiety and depression, increases our self-esteem, and it also tends to enhance our ability to be empathic towards others. A critical trait towards engaging, especially on such a sensitive topic. But uh, of course it's gonna come with different challenges that already exist out there. There's always gonna be a, a, a stigma that we have to try and undo. Am I crazy? Is it, is it a sign of weakness, inadequacy? Shame. How do I manage this within myself before I can even go and get help with someone else? Also, as I mentioned, learning essential communication skills. That's at the core of meaningful interaction. Empathic listening. Active listening. Not just listening for your turn to talk. Because you know what? Sometimes. And I've learned this time and time again. Sometimes they don't want your problem solving. Sometimes they just want to be heard. And also, and lastly, and probably most important, how do we create a safe space to just be dysfunctional? Because none of us have it all together. Behind all of the overly retouched profile pictures you'll see out there, there is a pimple-faced, blotchy-faced, vulnerable human being that just wants to understand and actually feel that they can be themselves, that there is a safe space. So there are two things that I'll leave you with before I leave the stage. One is a quote that I oftentimes reference when I'm feeling less than my powerful self when I'm feeling less than the agent of change that I try to be. And it's a quote from Mother Teresa. It simply says, I alone cannot change the world, but I can cast a stone across the waters to create many ripples. And the last thing I'll leave you with is a simple task. Slow down life. Assess your mental health. Truthfully, assess your mental health. And once you've done your own self-reflection, find a life partner that you're willing to take this mental health journey with and ask them one simple question. Are you okay? And listen, listen as though your lives depended on it because it may. Thank you. <laughs>